I like to share just a little bit about our next speaker. In my role as moderator, I have the honor of introducing you to a group of outstanding panelists. And of course, the president of the university. Dr. Hushman became the seventh president of Rowan University in 2012. I can tell you a great deal about his accomplishments and his training as an industrial and operations engineer, his rise to prominence as a leader at Drexel University, and then coming to Rowan University serving in the role as provost. Most of you know the story about the transformation of Rowan University, how we've expanded our imprint across South Jersey. Rowan is now a Carnegie ranked research institution with high research activity to medical schools and innovative formal partnership with two county colleges, Rowan College of South Jersey and Rowan College of Burlington County. But what some of you may not know about President Hushman is that his commitment to addressing persistent issues facing public education such as affordability, food insecurity, and racism stem from his own experience as an immigrant and his ethnic identity as an Iranian American. Dr. Hushman established the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion last year to lead not just in South Jersey, but across the country. This is what leadership looks like in this time of turmoil. Dr. Hushman. Thank you, Monica. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating in this very, very important conversation. It is, of course, a very, very difficult and trying time. This morning, I had an email from one of our students. The first line was, I wanted to say good afternoon, but I'm not going to because it is not a good afternoon. Because how did you let, for example, a uh, post from some racist individuals to be reposted by the university, something that I'm trying to find out. But whatever it is, is we know that we are living in a very, very difficult time. And and, uh, and it's happening during a pandemic and uh, an upcoming general election. It's like, you know, it's just like the just multiple, from multiple direction, uh, things are coming at everybody. And the latest, when well, what happened to Brianna Taylor, which, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm so disappointed that very few people talk about her and her tragic death, the way that she was killed in her own home, in her own bed, and just shocking. And then Ahmed Arbery that, you know, I have had exactly the same kind of experience that he did. I actually went to empty building. I actually, police was called on me when I was running. I was a runner. I was a marathoner. So I used to do this kind of thing. So when it happened to me, I was shocked. And then what happened to George? What is what is happening is what, what, what uh, I think Monica very clearly talked about is, is this systemic racism. And I think one needs to try to understand it so that they can then talk about it and hopefully try to get a resolution. Because time and again, you see people are talking, except they're talking past each other. And the latest one was actually what Brian Greasy said yesterday. Uh, that, you know, he said he is very upset with uh, Colin Kaepernick because he kneeled and he disrespects the American flag. And he does so because his two grandfathers, one of them Marine, the other one is US Army. And I fought in the Second World War and they were the, the greatest generation. And indeed they were. And I don't believe for a second that Colin was disrespecting the flag. I think what he was probably saying, I was trying to figure out what was he saying. I was saying that maybe he was actually talking about not uh, Brian Greasy's grandfather. Maybe he was talking about great, great grandfather, the people who brought him from Africa and asked him to work in plantation and then build this economy of this country and prepare it so that the, when the Second World War came, a powerful economy can became, became the world leader and removed Great Britain and France from the world stage. So there are these kind of arguments that are going back and forth and people are talking past each other. And I see it in my own life. I see it, you know, my own account. I can 
say that I'm a success story according to American definition of uh, success. I was born in a family that was destitute. My mom and dad were uneducated. They couldn't even sign their own names. 10 children and all, all of us lived in one room. And many, many days and weeks I would walk out or play in the streets with bare feet because I didn't have even pennies to buy shoes. And all of that gets to a situation where I end up leaving at the age of 19 and go to England and get educated and eventually come to this great country. And look at me, I'm now the president of a research university. I couldn't even remotely imagine even getting close to such, such a position. And yet I'm here. And I feel extremely proud of it. I love this country with all my heart. I do anything. Anything that I do to protect the interests and well-being of this country and its citizens. And I believe sincerely that every citizen does as well. All the African Americans do as well. But what I don't feel, and I really don't, and especially unfortunately with our current president, I don't feel like a first class citizen. I feel like a second class citizen. All that success doesn't mean anything to me. I really do feel like a second class citizen. Constantly feel wherever I go, I have to prove myself because of my brown skin, because I'm called sand nigger or things of that sort. And, and I can tell you stories. And so here is the success. But why is it that in my heart, I feel that something fundamental is missing? Because if it's all about economic success, I could have had that anywhere. I could have had it in my old country. But I left all of that. I left my brothers and sisters. I never saw my mom dying. I never saw my dad dying. I never saw my brothers getting married. I never saw my nieces and nephews being born. I gave all of that up for the ideals of America. Came in here in order to get that. And I, I thought that that was absolutely worth it. And the fact that the president of my country makes me feel as a second class citizen, it hurts me deeply. And I think that's really the conversation. I mean, to be honest, it was very hard for me to come and tell you this thing, but I think it's my responsibility to tell you so that hopefully we can have a conversation and we can understand what is really the fundamental reason. All I want to do is I want to be treated like an ordinary average person, nothing more. I don't want any entitlement. I don't want anyone to give me any benefit. All I want is whether it's my name is Ali or Brianna or Lashata or Steve or John or Mary, Wherever I am, however I look, however I dress, I'll be treated as equal as long as I follow the law, respect the country, respect the constitution, pay my taxes, and do all the good things that every citizen should do. That's really what I expect. And I assume that's really what, what that conversation is. So this is really what, what, what my take of this thing is. I, I, I hope that we can use these five or six sessions to really talk to each other openly without being disrespectful to each other, and really put everything on the table and see what, what, why is it that we cross each other? Why is it that we don't kind of, why is it that even the most successful people, I'm like in front of you, Monica, she is a brilliantly successful individual. Why does she have to worry about her son leaving home and not knowing whether, whether they will come back safe or not? Why should she be terrified while they are out? I feel the same way actually when my son is out. So this is really what, 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 we are dealing with and I, I would love to kind of see a wonderful conversation amongst everybody so that we can come up as better because my greatest hope as a president honestly sincerely is I want to have a university with every single person every one of you irrespective of how you look what you wear what your orientation is what your religion and everything else to feel at home and feel dignified feel that you're valued as equal to everybody else that's really the greatest benefit gift that anybody can get. I don't want anything else. That's all I want, equal. Not a special, average. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for the opportunity. Thank you, President Hushman, for your words, your powerful words, and also your presence. It speaks volumes. Uh, for those of you that have ju just joined us, we are now at 571 participants. I'd like you to tweet this out. Uh, post on Facebook, Instagram, hashtag, are you, we are not okay. Are you, we are not okay. We need you to get the word out because we have four other sessions that we'll be offering and this, this uh, conversation needs to continue.
For those of you also that have just joined us and are not sure about how to share your questions, please do go to the question and answer area, post your question, and I will get that question and I will pose that question to a specific panelist or if you'd like it uh, posed to the entire panel, please do let me know. Let me introduce you to our panelists. Shelley, Dr. Shelley Zion is a professor of urban education in the language literacy and sociocultural education department here at Rowan University and the founding executive director of the Center for Access, Success and Equity. Shelley's work seeks to understand how institutions, social systems, and individual experiences create and sustain systems of power and privilege and assure access for some while excluding others. Her research is situated within a framework of sociopolitical development informed by a range of critical theoretical perspectives and advanced by an understanding of the nature of both individual and systemic change. Shelley, thank you for joining us. Dr. Bill Kerrigan is the professor of history here in, at Rowan University in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. A native Texan, he graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in 1993. His PhD is from Emory. He is the author or editor of numerous scholarly articles and four books, including The Making of a Lynching Culture. V violence and Vigilantism in Central Texas, 1836 to 1916. Also, Forgotten Dead, Mob Violence Against Mexicans in the United States. Professors Kerrigan and Webb published a widely read article in the New York Times about their work, and they are currently working on a book-length study of failed or prevented lynchings in the United States. Dr. Sandra Joy is here with us as well. She's a professor in sociology and here at Rowan University, also in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. She's been on faculty since 2002, teaching courses such as race and crime, race and social change, and the sociology of death, dying, and bereavement. Dr. Joy is also a licensed clinical social worker. She's been, in, she's been an abolitionist in the anti-death penalty movement throughout her time and serves on the board of the campaign to end the death panel, penalty. She is the author of Coalition Building, Anti-Death Penalty Movement, Privilege, Morality, Race, Realities, and Grief, Loss, and Treatment for Death, Row Families Forgotten No More. And finally, we have our SGA president, Arielle Gideon. She's a senior in the Rick Edelman College of Communications and Creative Arts. She serves uh, also as the chapter president of the Lambda Rho chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She's a first generation college student and she's always looking for creative ways uh, to ensure that our campus is safe and inclusive for her peers. If you would bear with me just one moment before Dr. Zion comes on, I would like to read something to you. Eric Garner, John Crawford III, Michael Brown, Azale Ford, Dante Parker, Michelle Cousseau, Laquan McDonald, George Mann, Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Romaine Brisbon, Jermaine Reed, Matthew Ajibadi, Frank Smart, Natasha McKenna, Tony Robinson, Anthony Hill, Maya Hall, Philip White, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, William Chapman II, Alexa Christian, Brendan Glenn, Victor Manuel La Rosa, Jonathan Sanders, Freddie Blue, Joseph Mann, Salvato Ellswood, Sandra Bland, Albert Joseph Davis, Darius Stewart, Billy Ray Davis, Samuel DuBose, Michael Sabby, Brian Keith Day, Christian Taylor, Troy Robinson, Assam's Farrell Manley, Felix Kumi, Keith Harrison McCloy, Junior Prosper, Lamontez Jones, Patterson Brown, 
Dominic Hutchinson, Anthony Ashford, Alonzo Smith, Tyree Crawford, India Kager, Levante Biggs, Michael Lee Marshall, Jamar Clark, Richard Perkins, Nathaniel Harris Pickett, Benny Lee Tignor, Miguel Espinal, Michael Noel, Kevin Matthews, Betty Jones, Quintinio Legreer, Keith Childress Jr., Janet Wilson, Randy Nelson, Antroni Scott, Wendell Celestine, David Joseph, Kaylin Rockamore, Deshaun Perkins, Christopher Davis, Marco Loud, Peter Gaines, Tori Robinson, Darius Robinson, Kevin Hicks, Mary Trudillo, Demarcus Samir, Willie Tillman, Terrell Thomas, Seville Smith, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Terrence Crutcher, Paul O'Neill, Alterio Woods, Jordan Edwards, Aaron Bailey, Rennell Foster, Stephen Clark, Antoine Rose II, both M. Jean, Pamela Turner, Dominique Clayton, Etania Jefferson, Christopher Whitfield, Christopher McCorvey, Eric Reason, Michael Lorenzo Dean, Brianna Taylor, and George Floyd. We say your name. The rate at which Black Americans are killed by police is more than twice as high as the rate for white Americans. This is a non-comprehensive list of the deaths at the hands of police in the U.S. since Eric Garner's death in 2014. Eric Garner uttered, I can't breathe, when he was being choked to death by police on the streets of New York City. Six years later, we hear, I can't breathe, from George Floyd as he lay dying on the streets of Minneapolis with a police officer's knee on his neck for eight minutes. The murder of George Floyd is the match that lit the flame we see burning all over the country. Today's session will provide us with the historical and sociopolitical context that led us to this moment. We didn't get here overnight. Anti-Blackness is as American as apple pie. You may ask, what do you mean? Violence has been inflicted upon Black bodies since the first enslaved Africans arrived to this country in 1619, over 400 years ago. You may not be surprised to learn that some people believe that racism is something only that a few are privy to, narrow-minded, backwards, uneducated people believe this. But Robin D'Angelo says we have to stop thinking about racism simply as someone saying the N-word. We have to understand that racism is a system rather than just a slur. It is prejudice plus power. And in Britain and the US, it is designed to benefit and privilege whiteness by every economic and social measure. Everyone has a racial bias, but Dr. D'Angelo asserts that when you back a group's collective bias with lingering authority and institutional control, it is transformed. Our panelists will provide the content. They will provide the context but it is up to us to do the work. Dr. Zion? Monica, can I please jump in for one second and apologize by making a mistake of mentioning Brian Greasy when I meant Drew Brees. I'm sorry. Thank you. I knew who you meant. I was going to text you later. <laughs> Dr. Zion. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to start with a quick statement so that we can move forward to other folks and then questions. Um, the thing that I think is important for us to talk about is the idea that there is in fact nothing new here. What we are experiencing mm -hmm. now is an amplification of the system as it was designed and has been refined over the past 400 years, grounded in white supremacy, anti-blackness, and the institutionalization of racism. What has happened is that we have reached a tipping point, the culmination over the last month for 
of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on our communities, from diagnoses to death to economic impacts. The impact of Ahmad Arbery, who was hunted and lynched by white men who were then supported by the police and the justice system. The murder of Breonna Taylor in her bed, the killing of Tony McDade while in crisis. Amplify that by the actions of Amy Cooper, the liberal white woman who in the blink of an eye weaponized race against Christian Cooper. And then George Floyd, murdered before our eyes by police. These are not new events, but all of them coming at once has once again reinforced the idea that black people are not safe anywhere in these United States, not from overtly racist white men, not from police, not in our homes or jogging, not when we are in crisis and not from liberal white women when watching birds in the park, and not even in the face of a pandemic in our communities, our homes, our education, our work, and our healthcare systems. In all of these places, we are unsafe. The trauma of these events played on a 24-hour news cycle and manifest in our social media feeds is multiplied and the miscommunications, misunderstandings, and missed opportunities to be supported by our white colleagues and neighbors compounds that trauma. We need to address the systems issues, and we need to address the individual, interpersonal, and relational issues that have been brought to our attention by the intersection of these events. Thank you, Dr. Zion, for your opening comments. Now we'll hear from Dr. Bill Kerrigan. Yes, uh, thank you. Our first thing I wanted to say is I'm very grateful and honored to be here and to be asked to be part of this panel. I hope that uh, my comments will be helpful in some way. Um, as uh, Dr. Shaley mentioned, I have uh, studied lynching for most of my professional life. And despite that, I feel like I have remained a fairly optimistic person, person about change. But uh, in recent years, because of all of the things that Dr. Zion mentioned, I feel I've become more distraught and frustrated than ever. It seems to me that in my lifetime, I've known about white supremacy from my earliest days when I went to school with someone in Texas who was in the Ku Klux Klan, but it seems stronger than ever. Um, and the federal government's commitment to equal rights for everyone seems weaker. Never have I questioned or worried about it more, and I've worried about it plenty. Um, but let me uh, focus on what I know best, and that is history. And let me see if I can offer some things that I think the historical perspective might be able to add. I can go over more examples and details later, but let me uh, give you four areas in which I think history might be able to help us. First, as already has been mentioned, a history of racism um, and race in this country is not coincidental, but elemental. Uh, it goes back to the very founding of the country, and I can talk more in details about how this works, but um, race uh, is an essential ingredient of who we are, and it is a big question as to how we can separate it out because it is so deep in our history and it is uh, part of how we have developed as a nation for so long. It will not be easy and it has not been easy uh, to extricate it. And that's um, the task though that we must uh, rise to the challenge and, and make the, the promise of this great country really truly happen, which it, of course it never has. Um, a second thing is that history can be helpful as we try to find a way to talk to one another. Dialogue we know is important and uh, it seems we're more divided than we've ever been uh, in many different ways. And um, people see the same events from different perspectives. Um, and uh, history, I hope, can be a way in which we can find something that we can uh, talk about, learn about, study about and kind of uh, form some kind of common uh, foundation for discussion and dialogue between uh, all of us who live in this country. Um, a third thing is that I think history can be a time uh, to give us hope for change. Um, in 1857, when the Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott decision, the Dred Scott had no rights, which a white man was bound to respect. Did anyone think that within five years, there would be an Emancipation Proclamation, and within eight years, all four million slaves would be freed by constitutional amendment. I don't think even the most optimistic of the abolitionists believe that on that day. Um, and there are other examples in history as well. So that, uh, I think, hopefully can provide us 
some reason to go on even when things seem very depressing around us. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that history can provide role models for people who rose to challenges. I won't, I'll just mention one name of a person who I admire greatly in my research, and that's Ida B. Wells, who, um, who encountered in her life a traumatic event involving lynching, and it led to her uh, changing her, her direction of her life, and she became an activist protester, and she made a great difference, including, of course, being one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, she's one role model of how to take a, a tremendous tragedy, a personal tragedy in many ways for her, and turn it into kind of life-affirming positive change going forward. There are other examples, white and black, that history can provide to us in this moment as well. And if I have time later, I'd be happy to share some of those. But my final thought uh, is one that I'm going to steal from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I don't know if any of you read his uh, uh, editorial in the LA Times recently, but it was powerful and it resonated with me. One of the things that he said was that racism is like dust in the air. It's all around us and a lot of people can't see it unless you shine light on it in the right way. Um, white people uh, perhaps move around. They don't even see the dust that's choking their black friends until light is shined on it. And he said that right we have now is we've, we've turned light on that dust and people are finally seeing it and the threat that it poses. And he urged us to continue to shine the light on the dust that is racism in our society so we can work on trying to figure out how to deal with it. I look forward to our continued conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kerrigan. Dr. Sandra Joy. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sheila. I want to thank you for inviting me to this very crucial conversation that we need to have now and continue. Uh, and I am honored to be on this panel with um, these fine panelists. The comments that have been made already by Dr. Zion and Dr. Kerrigan are, are right on point in terms of embedding how we, we were, we're asked to spend a few minutes at the beginning to kind of talk about how we got here from our perspective. I'm going to be brief because I think um, bringing others into the conversation is crucial not to mention that we need to focus on solutions. So much we talk about, you know, wow, this is history um, repeating itself over and over again. And I really like the hopeful perspective that you offered, um, Dr. Kerrigan, because I, I share, I have to have some optimism and hope in the face of all of this. But once again, here we are, just as you said with your opening comments, um, actually with uh, six years ago with Eric Garner, and, it's, and it feels like history all over again. Uh, from the sociological perspective, and I'm hopeful that at least some of the 600 plus people on here have had a sociology class, so hopefully this sounds familiar, uh, we talk about using our sociological imagination, and that's a concept that C. Wright Mills came up with to try and link the macro, larger forces of society to the more micro everyday occurrences. And it's really important that we do that lest we fall victim to an individualistic sort of perspective of, oh, this is a, um, a bad apple case of, of uh, an officer as opposed to a systemic um, cultural problem within our police force and within our entire society. Um, it's been said, and I will um, say again, that systemic racism, even Dr. Hushman's comments, I appreciate very much to this um, point, are, are embedded within our history of our society um, from day one, and we cannot Un, um, discount or underestimate the power of systemic racism with the police brutality. Systemic um, racism that we're seeing is, is right in the center of this conversation. And that's at the macro level embedded in all of our institutions and we're seeing it um, affect um, us at a more micro level and sadly with, and I really appreciate you naming the names, and those are, like you said, not even all of them, but just the one since Eric Garner. I know there's plenty before then. Um, and, you know, how many do we not know because cameras weren't there to capture or, you know, it didn't make the news. Um, but, you know, when we take the micro um, tragic, horrific occurrences that happen with each of these cases and the most the three that we're talking about most recently in the last month or so, when you take them into a larger macro level perspective, as we do as sociologists, we brought it to the family impact, right? We've seen the tearful um, comments of um, George Floyd's daughter, his young daughter. His, old, his older son, other family members, um, and then even beyond that to the community level, um, we have to look at the ripple effect from the individual case to families and communities to race relations and you know, just go all the way, you know, connect, connecting those dots. When we look as sociologists at um, the macro level, we look at things like 
um, the political forces, economic forces, and certainly the social forces operating that um, create these horrific incidents, but also to draw on the hopeful side can lend to social change, can lend us to rise up as we're seeing. Um, there's some controversy about, about how we should um, organize, how we should uh, express our extreme outrage, our heartbroken um, feelings about what's happening right now. Um, but you know, we, we could talk about that if that comes up, but certainly the point is we're seeing an international level movement because people are fed up. Um, the economic factors, this stemmed, let's not um, underestimate the contribution of our capitalist society. This stemmed from a $20 bill, a $20 bill that was presumed in the case of George Floyd to be um, counterfeit and it caused all of this outrage, you know? Um, so, you know, that, and then you link that to as much in the Eric Garner case when he was selling loose cigarettes on the side, the protecting the industry of the um, cigarette uh, industry. And there's, so there's, there's so much that we could say about um, the economic forces, not just the discontent. It was a perfect storm, as you mentioned um, in your opening comments with COVID and the pandemic, people have been cooped up for three months. The, um, I don't need to you know, go into the unemployment rate. We know it's been astronomical and it's had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And so you add all of these political forces, economic forces, um, and socially, you know, we have not, as the famous book that came out, I want to say 2012, Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow, we're seeing that um, playing out all over again. You know, I appreciate um, the historical viewpoint so much because we've gone from the slave codes to the black codes to broken windows or stop and frisk. You know, it's just another um, way that the community is, um, black community is being targeted. So there's much more that could be said, but I'm going to stop at this point and, and let you continue because I don't want us to run out of time and bring other people in. But um, certainly it's very, uh, very much can be said from the sociological perspective. So I'll be happy to share more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I want to remind uh, the panelists to watch the pace of your speech so that the interpreters can catch uh, everything that you're saying for those individuals out there that need to to be able to understand and hear you. Thank you. And finally, we have Ariel Gideon, who is the president of the Student Government Association here at Rowan. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you for the opportunity to do so. Um, I'm a very proud uh, member of the Black community as a Black woman, and to be able to uh, be here with my peers who have supported me through this uh, this moment in our history. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, starting off, um, we have lost countless numbers of lives due to police brutality. There have been counter arguments circulating that have been used to justify the deaths in the black, black community. I'm thinking of Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, and many who are just black people in America killed by police brutality. In the year 2020, we've been had enough. We finally had the impact of waking up those who are so willing to have a blind eye on such issues. We have support of all 50 states and around the world. This is more than a political issue. It's a human rights issue. To quote our forever president, Barack Obama, ultimately it's gonna be up to a new generation of activists to shape strategies that best fit the times. And that's um, pretty much what I have to say on this area. It, it really does, take our new generation. We have seen so much. We have our history textbooks that only tell us a little bit of our history. And so we find our ways to make sure that we are educating ourselves and our peers on ways that we can improve our country. Thank you, Eric. For those of you that have just joined us, please do tweet, uh, please do post on uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, other areas. We're at 623 participants right now. And the hashtag is are you we are not okay. So we've gotten some questions in for our panelists. And so I'll go ahead and and ask the first question that came in. Uh, so Dr. Joy, as someone who has been fighting against racial injustices and disparities, what do you say to those who are already overwhelmed or gassed out during these trying times? Uh, 
Oh, that's an excellent question. I feel I feel that energy from a lot of folks these days. People are tired. People are overwhelmed, um, discouraged, and feeling like you know what else can be done. Um, the most important thing I, I I feel that we need to do to keep our energy levels up is to um, is to join together and and I mean virtually is fine. Unfortunately, that's been the way we've had to do it these last few months, but. Um, we need to try and go to if, if it has to be virtu virtually that's better than nothing um go out to events now that we're able to more to uh, protest or um just make phone calls and talk to people who share our um, outrage so that we don't feel so alone and so alienated um because it can be very very tiresome um and remind ourselves of things like what dr kerrigan said you know when um that we couldn't have anticipated certain change when it comes around and just, uh, I get discouraged myself with incrementalism. Oh, you know, Dr. King wrote this book, you know, why we can't wait from the Birmingham jail, you know, and saying, you know, time is neutral. Um, but so I'm hesitant to say, well, you know, it's gonna happen, you know, let's have some incremental change. But uh, so that's not necessarily my position. I know that that's something a lot of people will say but we need to um, take some action steps uh, and, and have conversation not only about, first and foremost, about how discouraged we are. You know, call one another, be there for each other, but then to start to organize. There's power in organizing. There's power in coming up with solutions and sharing them with one another in a community. Um, and I know, so I won't go into a list that I have just now. I know there'll be an opportunity before we finish our time, um, but I have some um, concrete steps that that I didn't come up on my own, certainly, but the communities and organizations and wonderful activists and uh, nonprofits have come up with, I'll be happy to share. Thank you, Dr. Joy. Dr. Zion, what is your response to uh, your colleagues, uh, faculty on campus who say, I'm not racist, but I don't know what to say right now. We're all racist. That's the first thing. And I don't think we make any changes and we get any better until we acknowledge that, that if you were born, raised, and educated in the United States, you have absorbed racism like the dust in the air, like the water that you're surrounded by. That's it, that's all. That's why people need to understand and examine what white supremacy and anti-blackness is all about. Um, so I think that's the first thing is we're not gonna get any further if we stay in conversations that are intellectual rather than emotional. If we stay in a, oh, it's not me, it's them. We have to really look at our own parts in all of this. Um, and I think that's equal for members of minority or minoritized communities, we have all absorbed the lessons of racism, of anti-blackness, and of white supremacy. So my first step is that, is admit and acknowledge you've got that as a foundational bit um, and work to uncover that. I think the second part of it is that while it is important to know and to engage with the intellectual, historical, sociological, whatever, it is equally as important to engage in the interpersonal and relational and emotional parts. Um, and so that's about building authentic relationships. It's about reaching out and talking to people who are not like you. It is about connecting with students and wondering and being curious and open to understanding their actual lived experience. It's about becking away, I think, from expertise and trying to know things and instead be really willing to listen and to feel and to engage. Um, what I got. Thanks, Dr. We have also gotten a question in, and this is uh, certainly one that any of the panelists can respond to. In the most recent protests, Americans are calling for federal and the state government to defund the police force. What are your thoughts on defunding the police, 
to make way for new strategies, new institutions for public safety. And remember to slow down your the pace of your uh, response, please, for the interpreters. Um, I'll jump in and more slowly because I know I'm guilty of talking very fast, so I'll try and be slow. Um, but I didn't want to necessarily jump in if others had comments who haven't spoken yet. So, um, Bill, did you have something, Ariel? I can give you my thoughts on this. Obviously, I'm not an expert on contemporary issues. My off the top feeling about this is that I think we'd have to be carefully done if we any kind of not well thought out defunding of the police, I'm sure would end up just defunding the poor parts of the country who need policing and I'm sure wealthy areas would maintain their policing. Instead, it might be, I would think about how to reward police departments that uh, have a good record on these issues of police violence and treatment of African Americans. To me, lifting up and rewarding uh, the kind of behavior and, and treatment that we want would be a positive step forward. Perhaps also defunding and punishment for those departments that don't live up to certain standards. So I can see something like that um, moving forward. I'm not exactly sure about what the proposal is, but that's my off the top of the head uh, thoughts. So I have some comments that relate to Philadelphia in particular. Is this a good time to jump in? Okay. Um, there's a petition going around. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, the petition is going around by Action Network. Um, the problem is this, the perspective in, uh, there, in increasing funding to the police, because here's the problem, there, there's a petition going around that demand no increase in the budget for uh, 2021 for the Philadelphia police, uh, because what's happening is it's a zero sum equation, right? There's only so much money. So if you're putting more money into police and you're taking it out of community services, we're being more reactionary, we're doing a more punitive instead of prevention. And some, some numbers that come along with this petition are telling, and I won't read all of them, but just a little bit, just to give you some insight. So um, right now, Mayor Kinney in Philadelphia has put forward a budget that cuts almost 650 million from the programs that our city's residents need to survive while increasing the police budget by 14 million. So the Department of Public Health, for instance, is slated for over $8 million cut over global pandemic. And when projects that put leaders of color on the street to stop violence are defunded, when parks and rec programs that save lives every summer are shuttered, uh, sh shattered and face a $13 million cut, we're demanding no increase Philadelphia Police Department. Um, so this petition is rejecting a budget that increases police funding and cuts the services so that you have to talk about them hand in hand. It's not just that, oh, we're just gonna take money an uh, punitive away from the police because they're misbehaving. Um, it's because, you know, when you look at it, and I don't have the numbers, but I definitely remember when stop and frisk was in its height, um, there was actually a, almost a direct amount of money coming out of education funding into um, policing um, to fund the police stop and frisk programming. So we have to look at the overall picture. Why is it that we want to stop funding the police? Well, because you're taking money out of a more preventive or intervention, early intervention programming that could um, decrease uh, some of the behaviors that the police force uh, claim to be and I say claim to be, because a lot of it is uh, smoke and mirrors, um, concerned with when things happen, such as what happened in, um, in the case of George Floyd. So I, I just encourage us to look at the whole picture, you know, that it, that it is a zero sum, we don't have unlimited money, and for increasing to the police, what is being sacrificed in the process? Dr. Zion, would you like to respond to this? Yeah, I would just want to, I guess, raise the question of what neighborhood actually needs police. And I'm serious about that because when you look at the impact of police on um, the most impacted, marginalized, minoritized, and ravaged neighborhoods, I I'm not sure that I see evidence of any assistance. Um, and I say that even truthfully from my own front porch this last weekend where my neighborhood was tear gassed by police for no reason other than the fact that they were doing a show of force. There was nothing happening here. There was nothing to see. 
What they didn't manage to do was to stop any kind of the damage that happened to the businesses on my block, right? They didn't do anything that helped with that, but they did shoot tear gas into crowds of, of people, including old people and young people um, who were just on the block observing their occupation. And so to me, the question is not which neighborhoods need it, but what purpose are they actually there to serve? If the, if the service is to assist people who may be um, experiencing some kind of trauma or violence or negative interactions, there are other ways than people in full riot gear, military, militarized spaces and weaponry. I would like to see mental health folks out there. I would like to see other forms of intervention out there. But I think our question really needs to be, what is the purpose of policing, period? Thank you. For those of you that have asked about uh, having discussions with uh, police officials, please do uh, try to attend our last session on June 15th. Where do we go from here? Navigating campus and community. We have invited uh, the Glassboro Police Department as well as other community partners. So you will have an opportunity to direct those questions uh, to directly to our police partners. Uh, Ariel, did you want to respond to that question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so this topic, defunding the police system, um, it can raise a lot of questions and like ideas in people's head. And so coming from my personal perspective, so defunding the police system is not my personal ideal practice to make new ways for strategies and institutions for public safety. Um, when there's something bad that is happening, the first series of numbers we are taught is 911, right? So when people respond, um, when people respond to certain certain situations, saying, "Oh, it's just a few bad apples on the police force," it places the wrong emphasis on our mission. So one thing I want to make sure it's clear: it's not enough for people to be uh, to not be racist. We need our police force to be actively anti-racist, as the term, as the quote, as you heard previously. So also it's imperative for it to be reiterated that the police force goal is to the protection and safety for all citizens. So when you lose that emphasis on that mission, then when personal fear of someone's skin color comes in place, that's when that's when you lose that, that goal of protection and safety for all citizens. So that's my two cents in that area. And we appreciate your two cents, Ariel. Uh, so we have a question, uh, and I'd like Ariel if you could take this, uh, take a stab at this first. Uh, so we have many of our students uh, participating in protests around the state uh, and in Philadelphia. I think you've participated as well. What does resistance look like uh, outside of protesting in the streets for students? Yes, so um, as you mentioned, my family and I, we had participated in protests out in Ocean City as well. And so as my sorority sisters who have participated in uh, protests in Philadelphia. So first of all, I wanna say thank you to my peers for participating in the protests. Also, I think something that needs to be said, this is a message to people who are black. Stop telling people how to, stop telling black people how to protest. I think that's something that's very needs to be said, and I'm here to say it. Stop telling black people how to protest. Um, and furthermore, um, there are others, uh, such as people who are immunocompromised and other reasons for not being able to protest, but there are many ways to support us. Um, and so we ask that you keep learning, uh, make donations to support organizations, and share information with your peers. As you can see, social media is very powerful, but it isn't enough. It's way more than posting a black square on your Instagram, as you've seen uh, this past Tuesday, or posting things on your Instagram story. Because we all know your Instagram story is only for 24 hours. But who are you outside the online platform? And I think that's what really matters as well. How do you treat your colleagues? Do you make sure that they're, they're CC'd on that email? If you have an issue with them with your colleague, do you go straight to your supervisor or do you talk to them? And think about for our students. Um, with Royal University being a PWI, a predominantly white institution, um, my experience so far, I'm going to my senior year, I had a, I had a, a great uh, past three years here. Um, we see a kind of like a division. Um, we jokingly say, oh yeah, there's Rowan, but they're also black Rowan, right? Um, so we talk, we, we notice um, that division, but then it comes to the areas of, are you staying for your black peers? And so we wanna make sure that, yes, thank you for reposting our stuff. 
thank you for with a comment in your emoji fist. But we need to make sure that you're bringing that action outside of social media as well. Thank you. So our next question is uh, related to uh, what's happening in the country in terms of the demographics, the, the quickly shifting demographics. We are becoming more and more diverse. Uh, white representation by 2045 is expected to be um, the uh, exceeded people of color will exceed, I'm sorry, white representation by 2045. And what this means is that there may be a lot of white folks out there that are afraid. Afraid of what? Can you respond to that, Bill, and then Sandra, and then Shelly? Uh, that is a tough one for me to answer. Of course, you know, it's, uh, I don't doubt that it is true that there are many whites who are afraid of this uh, demographic uh, transition. Um, whites are um, it, it, one of the key things to, that I spent a lot of time trying to think about is to get inside the minds of whites who do things that I think are hard to comprehend. My original research got started when I was trying to understand why uh, 15,000 people at least that was what the newspapers estimated attended the burning of Jesse Washington in 1916, not very far from where I grew up uh, in the middle of the day. And uh, I looked at the photographs of the crowds of victims and I had a hard time uh, understanding uh, why they had, um, you know, participated in this event. It was, uh, it was, uh, as a young person, it was very hard for me to understand. These were not I understood very deeply racist people I and mean, it kind of my older view of race was was a different thing. And I understood people who hated black people, sadistic, evil, violence. I knew they existed. Uh, and I could imagine those people might have been leading the mob. But I had a hard time believing that all the people in the photograph were that kind. There must have been ordinary people who walked their children to school, who were had jobs as grocers or delivered the mail. These were a bunch of ordinary people who nevertheless thought that at, at least tolerating and doing nothing about the burning of a human being was okay. And so my research has been focused on this question of why did ordinary people lynch? And I won't have time to go into my explanation for the whole thing, but one of the things is to try to get inside how does society what does society say are, are good actions and behaviors by white people? How are white people rewarded? What are they praised for? And it's changed over time, but of course, in the period that I studied, certainly whites were praised for uh, taking the law into their own hands to regulate uh, the actions of racial and ethnic minorities. These were people who were to be applauded. And uh, it shouldn't be surprising that children grow up uh, emulating their fathers when they're told uh, that this is the right kind of behavior. And I do worry um, that this, uh, there's a, still exists today, uh, elements um, derived from this earlier mindset of who and what is rewarded within our larger society. In any event, understanding why white people are afraid and angry is an important one. And I, I don't have the full answer to it. I do know that there are lots of Poor white people. I grew up in a rural area of Texas, and a lot of poor white people who are very um, upset about uh, their lives. They feel whenever people say they've been privileged, they uh, resent it because they feel like their lives are very poor and they've been left behind and they're marginalized. And they don't see any benefits of it. In some ways, the system says, "Well, you've got all this white privilege. All this system is all set up to support you." maybe you're an, an epic failure because your life is such that it is. I don't know everything about why they're so angry, but it's it's real. There are frustrated people out there and they are easily manipulated by today's social media and other websites to become very dangerous um, in today's world. Um, that's That's the best I can do, sorry. No apologies needed. Thank you for your thinking on that. Uh, Dr. Kerrigan, Dr. Joy, then Dr. Zion. 
Actually, I'd like to pick up where Dr. Kerrigan left off because I was going to comment on white privilege. Um, so white people um, have been sold this bill of goods that um, they're supposed to, there's this is an entitlement. White privilege is, is by its very nature meant uh, it's invisible, right? It's invisible and it's not meant to be, you know, it's just like the glass ceiling, right? So um, white people historically um, have benefited from their whiteness and they still benefit from their whiteness, no mistake about it, but not in the same way as they have with the narrowing um, shrinking of the middle class and the extreme um, disparity between the 1% and others. White people are starting to um, become very upset with their economic plight and they feel they're entitled. Um, this is not all a conscious process, mind you, this is on a subconscious level. They don't necessarily know that this is what's going on with them, but we're seeing a resurgence of the alt-right globally. And we certainly saw it uh, with the infamous um, demonstrations in Charlottesville that en ended with the murder of Heather Heyer. Um, and they're being emboldened by our leaders. Trump has made himself a very easy scapegoat but it goes deeper than Trump. Trump has tapped on a discontent among the white community because, you know, when back and after the war and you had the GI Bill, which is affirmative action for white people, um, essentially, and white people were doing well economically. And now um, then you with, you know, obviously with the civil rights movement and the backlash to that and affirmative action and, um, White people started to, generally speaking, of course, not all, you always have differences, but generally speaking, many white people were very, um, there was a backlash to that movement going, wait a minute, you know, you're asking for too much. That's taking it too far, you know, um, and Dr. King, didn't he take care of all of that? We don't really have racism anymore. Um, we are um, all fooled into believing we live in a meritocratic society, that we are rewarded on the basis of our individual merit. That is a myth um, that's been shot down by those of us in academia and others, um, but there are still many, um, as, as Dr. Kerrigan said, white people, and I come from the South as well, in Virginia, and very um, economically deprived area where a lot of white people are very much falling in line with Trump and the alt-right and believing that he's got an answer for them. But, be, but I think they're, they're obviously doing better, way better comparatively than communities of color, but they're not doing as well as they think they're supposed to. So they're being, it's the whole divide and conquer. They're being um, pit against uh, communities of color by the 1%, people in positions of power and political leaders. And they're, they're you know, they're, it's often been said, they drink the Kool-Aid, you know, they feel like, you know, they're, that um, when Trump, throws a bone and he's, 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 um, they feel more and more emboldened. We saw, you know, without the, without the um, hiding behind the, the Klansmen robes now just coming right out with the tiki torches and protesting and being much more bold. So, I mean, there's obviously economic foundations, social ones, and, and you see the politics that are feeding into it all and it's all um, connected. So we have to find a way to help um, white folks who are not doing as well as they think they're economically, look at the larger forces operating and join in coalition with others and understand that, you know, as, as badly as they're doing, they could be doing worse still um, and not turned against one another. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Dr. Zion. I'm legit not sure I have an answer to the question. Um, I think there's a couple of things that are worth considering. One is the idea of ordinary people. I like that phrase, Dr. Kerrigan, but I think that maybe the problem is that, as I'd said earlier, that if you were born, raised, and educated in the United States, that the ordinary people were born, raised, and educated into a racialized society that, as Dr. Joy then stated, means they feel entitled to a particular set of opportunities and resources and experiences. Um, and then I think if we look historically at the way that black people have been positioned in society, they were never supposed to be the ones that had any of the goodies. So when you think about operating from a scarcity mindset, there's not enough. And my people are the best people, if you're white people, then how dare those people get more or better or different than I have. 
So I think there's a few really complicated psychological processes in place. And I also a little bit am a fan of uh, the comedy of when Louis C.K. said, and maybe it's just that white people are scared of what's coming to them if they get the same thing they put out for centuries. Could I, could I add a point? I really appreciate what you said, Dr. Zion. I think that's right on point. Um, I wanted to add, um, if you haven't had a chance, those of you who are interested in exploring this further, to read White Fragility, it does a really good job at looking at these psychological processes that are going on with, with white, uh, many white people and the white guilt, they don't know what to do with that, you know? And so uh, this is, you know, where separating the individual from the larger systemic processes operating in society can, can help white folks say, okay, it's not, you know, there's a white power structure, white supremacy, let's call it by name as many times as we possibly can. This is white supremacy operating to divide and conquer um, and it's not that I'm a bad person or I have to feel all of this personal guilt, but we do have to make reparations in one form or another, or many forms, not even just one form. And we have to acknowledge that. And um, yeah, White Fragility does a really good job of having these conversations. And I was very proud to be a part of my um, colleagues who read that book um, at, at Rowan about a year or so ago in a book, um, club but yeah i just i feel like you're absolutely right dr zion so much of it is a psychological processes and folks and i see it with my students all the time in my race classes not knowing what to do with all this information and white students will say things like oh here comes february the hate white people month you know when we talk about black history you know instead of having like um you know uh dr kerrigan said we need to have role models and there are role models historically everybody probably knows John Brown, but there are other role models of white people who have resisted systemic racism that we need to be talking about so that white people see other models and they don't feel like it's Rachel Dolezal that they have to present, pretend to be black because being white is necessarily racist, that they can have other examples. But I'm talking too much, so I'm gonna stop. Thank you, Dr. We've gotten a question in a few times. Um, and so I'm going to start with Ariel uh, in responding to this question, and I'm going to offer a response as well on behalf of um, the executive leadership team and our colleagues in student affairs. And the question is related to uh, Ariel. You mentioned social media as being a powerful uh, influence. However, we also know that social media can spread hate. And certainly we have seen recent examples of students, college students, who have posted insensitive or offensive, even racist things. And uh, they, and so many in the public or may, maybe as well as students um, that have seen these images believe that nothing happens to these individuals and they should be kicked off campus. Uh, as SGA president, Ariel, could you speak to this? And I'll certainly speak to it as um, a, a member of the leadership team here at Rowan. So um, one of the things that I express um, in my first term as SGA president, if, so, if y'all didn't know, I was elected as the first black female uh, SGA president. And that's something I take a lot of pride in. And when I think about my first term, which ended May 31st, I got reelected to my second term, I was expressed to the student body that I'm always transparent with them. And so uh, I mean, it was uh, two days ago, it was the first time I saw on Twitter um, the video and the pictures of uh, two uh, Rowan students um, uh, speaking um, hateful speech. And excuse me if I get emotional because it is a very personal topic to me. I remember um, when my sister and I was walking home to my sister's house and a car uh, drove by and screamed the N word, hard our ass. We were just walking home from school to my sister's house and to see students, you know, saying, oh, someone dared me uh, to say that word, you know, on camera, it hurts, it hurts so bad because like, how can you not know the impact that word has on us and our community? And excuse me again for getting emotional because people make it so easy to make excuses for them talking about, Oh, oh yeah, we weren't taught that when we were kids. And a lot of questions stem, like, stem from, oh, what age should I tell my kids about race? So when I'm grateful for social media, <laughs> because if it wasn't for Twitter, I would not have known. <laughs> 
that that was happening, but also it calls about um, bringing those students for accountability because we can't make excuses for them. And that one of the things that I hope and in um, and the way that our university has handled situation like that in the past is that they change the way they handle it. Because my peers and I, we are sick and tired of the way that things have been communicated in the past. So one of the issues that we have expressed, the student body has expressed was like, um, we, we wouldn't hear about it. We, we see the message that social media team handles and then, but we won't see like a, a direct response on that. But um, today we saw the message that has done, that has been uh, done by um, that organization. And so um, one of the things that we hope, uh, the students hope that they'll, that students will be held accountable, but also re-education process for them as well. And so uh, excuse me if my answer is long, but I really think it's important to touch on this issue as well was um, all my kids are too young to talk about race. So I, I'm, I'm incorporating this uh, question as well, because there's we always hear the excuse like, oh, I'm only 15, I'm only 17, I was only this age. So I will, I would like to bring a perspective for you all. Um, there was a study that shows that by kindergarten, children show many of the same racial attitudes held by adult in our adult in our cultural culture. Excuse me, I have a list, I have a visit line in. <laughs> They have already learned to associate some groups with a higher status than others. What I recommend is to teach your students and children about field trips. So many field trips that you see are about like the aquariums, the zoos, and so forth. And they're too scared to take them to like historical uh, places. I was in fifth grade when we had a school field trip to the National Black and Wax Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. So I was in fifth grade when we went to our museum. And so that's why I seen for the first time a replica look of a slave ship and also even more historical context of black history and life side figures, important black, black figures. So um, my suggestion to students is to, um, to, is to call out any instances where you see where students are, are, who are just so blatant and blatant in their, in their uh, racial hatred, call them on social media because there's some of the context we say, oh yeah, black Twitter is gonna handle them. And that's exactly what we do. And we make sure that they're held accountable. We just hope that our um, institutions like Rowan University and other colleges are standing with us and being outright in public in their statements. We don't want to hear it like it's handled and swept under the rug. We want to hear exactly what actions were taken against those students. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. And that's a, a great way for me to pick up uh, what happens uh, to students. But first, let me provide some context. Uh, prior to the launch of the division, in 2019, we didn't have an office outside of our uh, Office of uh, Code of Con uh, Community of, of Affairs, Community Standards, I'm sorry. We didn't have an office dedicated to addressing um, issues of discrimination, um, gr uh, grievances, complaints around race. So we had a Title IX office and now that work is situated within the Office of Student Equity and Compliance. That office investigates claims that are related to any of the protected categories, which include race, religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, those areas that we uh, talk about that are uh, certainly ones that we are seeing in the media and, and, and on social media and certainly related to what Ariel shared. When students post things on social media that are offensive to others, we've seen the N-word, we've seen blackface, we've seen swastikas. And so students respond to, they respond to those images and say, why are those students allowed to remain at Rowan University? And so, although we find this behavior abhorrent, uh, offensive, speech is protected. We understand that we must protect freedom of speech, but we also understand that we hold ourselves to a code of ethics. There's a code, a student code of conduct. And so, when we get these complaints from students, these grievances, they, each one of them are reviewed to ensure that the the that students are complying with the student of code of conduct 
and making sure that students are not harassing, uh, students are not um, uh, involved in e any illegal contact or violations. What we are working to do moving forward is to be more transparent in terms of uh, in a totality of how we look at these cases. So we certainly can't share uh, information about personal students, but we can share moving forward how many cases that we receive related to these areas and generally what's been the response in terms of how we respond to these. Now, certainly if students are not expelled, suspended from campus, they have not um, violated the student code of conduct, we can still provide education. And I'm glad Ariel, you mentioned education. And that's the piece that we also connect through our Office of Social Justice and Inclusion and Conflict Resolution. Programming and support for students as well as programming and support for the entire campus on how we provide uh, education and really challenge and confront and disrupt some of the hateful speech um, and images that we see online. So at this point, we are at 417 and we promised that we would focus on where do we go from here solutions. So I'm going to go to each of the panelists and ask them based on their particular area of expertise, what should we be doing as a community so that we are not six years from now talking about someone else who has died unarmed in the streets and we are protesting, rioting, and trying to host another series. What should we do, Dr. Zion? Can you please summarize that again? Absolutely. What should we do so that we are not back here six years from now talking about another case that has sent us uh, to the streets uh, online in classrooms, responding in the way that we are today. What can we do from your perspective? I think the only way that change will come is if individual people make a commitment to engaging authentically and in the long term in both the interpersonal and institutional work that needs to happen to dismantle the systems. Um, I'm not sure that I would say I feel hopeful that that will happen. I think that every time we have incidences such as this, a few more people make that commitment, a few more people um, start to engage in more authentic relationships and more exploration of their own thinking and ideology in more institutional engagement. Um, and I wish I did know how we get more people committed on the regular to this. Um, there are a million and one things that are available readily by quick Google searches for the things that you can do if you want to know. The interwebs are, are, are inundated with the 10 things white people need to know, the 20 things you should learn about black history, the seven ways to change your school, the 16 ways to modify your curriculum, right? There's a lot of resources. We are not short on knowledge. I think what we're short on is the will, the commitment, um, the doubling down on our energy and effort. It's maybe the most um, visibly manifest element of privilege is that you can choose to engage or not. And too often those with privilege engage momentarily and then dip out the moment something else comes along. So that's what we need is the commitment from people who hold the most privilege to stay in the fight. Thank you, Dr. Zong. Thank you. Thank you. Reach people that others cannot, uh, but it requires consistent effort on, on, on my behalf to um, 
reach out to individuals who don't understand or who are worse than don't understand. Um, I think that sharing specific stories of racism in the present and in the past uh, can be helpful in this modern world of social media where so much is shared and reposted, the more personal and specific that you can be in sharing your stories, uh, I think uh, that can be very powerful. Uh, as I mentioned already, I believe in um, sharing not only those stories of racism and discrimination and pain and hurt, but also uh, positive examples where people have done the right thing as a guide uh, for how folks can move forward. Um, I will, uh, let me just, uh, there's a story that I, I want to share that I, it's part of my research, as I kind of I mentioned already, the current project I'm looking on is prevented lynchings. And I moved to this project in some ways because I wanted to find, uh, after writing many books on the history of lynching, to find some way to try to reach out to, um, I don't know, a different audience. People who buy my books on lynching, there are only a certain kind of people already. Um, and uh, anyway, in doing this, I'm going to tell you about just one story, um, and I'll just try to keep it brief because I know we have to move on. Uh, there was an African-American male who was put on trial for the murder of a white woman in 1923, I believe. And uh, there was a, he wasn't lynched because they protected him with a machine gun in the courtroom. But during the trial, uh, there was a person in the, in the uh, audience who actually happened to be a law officer. He was there for something else and he found something was wrong with the case. I won't go into great details, but through his, his singular act, he ended up uh, proving that the person who had accused the black man had been completely lying and had made up the story and ended up saving this individual's life. And uh, that's, he's, he, he's a flawed individual, I, and, and like all of us are, but he did something that mattered in that moment. And I wish that uh, there were stories that we shared of, of these kinds of decisions that could make a difference. And uh, I, I feel too often that, um, that we, we don't um, give our young people enough uh, good role models to follow and uh, or unattainable role models to follow. In reality, everybody who's listening to this call can make a difference uh, in, in this world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joy and then Ariel. Okay, thank you. So this is a really important part of this presentation today. Um, look, there's lots of ways that we can engage in creating social change, right? We don't all have to be on the streets. We see a lot of people in the streets and that's making a big impact, but not everybody is so inclined to take that route towards social change, particularly now during the pandemic. There are some people who are immune, immune compromised. They're nervous about being out on the streets. So, you know, it's particularly challenging and that's particularly impressive given COVID-19 that we see so many people out. But for those who are uncomfortable, there are many things that can be done. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. We can try and do as many as we want. Certainly there are petitions going around, Justice for Floyd petition for George Floyd, um, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Color of Change. We can certainly sign petitions. They take less than half a, a, a minute to do. And I get them on my email all the time, as I'm sure many of you do. That's the least what we can do. If we have finances, you know, there's a lot of uh, people who will make uh, a little bit of fun of checkbook activism, you know, people will write checks, but hey, we need that. There's a national bail fund network that you can contribute to, or a local bail fund, because protesters out there are being arrested for simply walking down the street and um, expressing in a very peaceful way their rights, the tear gas, all of these things are happening. People are being rounded up. I know many people have been um, arrested and we need that bail fund um, right now. Um, there are numerous policy solutions we can work on to end police violence. And I want to point out, and I know that I'm talking fast because I'm mindful of the time and I'm throwing out a lot of um, resources. Uh, so if anybody, this is, I have an easy, easy email, wants a list of this, it's my last name, joy at rowan.edu. Any of the 533 of you, hopefully not all of you, but it's okay. I don't care. I'll figure it out. Um, email me. I'll be happy to email this list of resources. Um, the policy solutions such as, you know, ending once and for all um, broken windows uh, policing, 
community oversight is so important. Another policy we need to work on is getting the community involved in oversight when there are instances of police abuse. That's on the tail end. Obviously, we need to prevent it from happening, but to the extent that it's already happening, we need to be involved as a community. And there are concrete ways that I want to encourage everybody. A wonderful website is joincampaignzero.org. Um, Joint Campaign Zero has a lot of these uh, solutions that I'm mentioning. Um, no longer, particularly we talked about white folks who want to be good allies. And I believe that there are a lot of white people who do want to be good allies and they just don't know how to do it. It seems like a cop out though when I hear people say, well, I, it's not my issue and I don't want to be um, outspoken as a white person because then I, you know, t talking for other people. Um, so I'm just going to be quiet and let them, them being communities of color, um, be the ones. We simply need to ask, go to them, you know, and we have a methodology we use in sociology, participatory action research. You, when you gather research and you go out into communities and you ask, I'm so sorry that my, my computer's making noise, but um, so, and, and as Dr. Zahayan said, there are any number of resources that you can simply do a Google on. No longer is an excuse not to know how to be a good ally. Um, just put, how can I be a good white ally in the movement? And any list, number of, of uh, ideas can come up and they're good resources. Um, so um, know your rights um, and make sure as professors, as um, activists as organizers. We are having events where we're helping people know their rights as protesters. ACLU has put that out. There's There are apps that we can download. Have your phone charged when you're out simply going to the grocery store. You know, one of the essential places we can actually go um, or have been able to go to get groceries. You don't know what you're gonna come across. I mean, I we wouldn't know who George Floyd is today if it wasn't for the brave soul, the young woman who stood there and videotaped. So simply having a charged phone, but there is an app the ACLU has put out, the ACLU's mobile justice app, that you can automatically upload your recording of a police conduct to the local ACLU chapter, which is important because your phone can be taken from you and stomped on. So the quicker you can get that whatever you're recording, whether it is direct police violence towards citizens or uh, violence towards protesters, um, I, you know, there's any number of these being loaded. We're seeing them on Twitter every day. Um, so, and calling out white supremacy on a micro level, doing, uh, organizing, you know, book clubs to read books like what I mentioned, White Fragility or others, um, and trying to do political education um, in our, not just universities, but in our community. You know, let's get out of our ivory tower and let's go into the community and let's organize with others who are in other um, professions, um, or the ordinary people that we were talking about. Let's let's work together to um, increase that. So I, I'm gonna stop. There's other solutions. Again, I have a, a whole list of things. I'm more than happy, I'm more than welcome, I should say, to email me at joy at Rowan if you'd like to see them. Thank you. And Eric, where do we go from here? Uh, I'm sorry, there, where do we go from here from this, from a student vantage point uh, so that six years from now, uh, we are not back here again talking about the same issues. Uh, thank you. So to my college community, to my peers, I know y'all feel hurt and angry. Use that pain to enact, to enact change. Hold your peers accountable. So the so-called cookout that you invite your allies to, well, this is the cookout. Come out to the cookout and, and help us um, throughout the protest and step up. So one of the things that is important is to vote as well. I was a 16 when 45th became president. I remember counting the days so I could turn 18 to vote. Register to vote, vote in your local elections, run for office too. Um, this is also a directed to parents as well. Talk to, your, talk to your kids about government and politics because so often you see, you don't hear uh, discussions like that at the dinner table. It's like politics is not a dinner table discussion. Uh, it is now. Teachers, educate yourself on these issues and support your students. Work towards to have your field trips at Black Museums. Thank you for the aquarium zoos. Have them at the Black Museums too. It's something that um, I read as well, and it's for my peers because one of the things I noticed is that not a lot of people wanted to put that on their social media because it ruins their aesthetic. 
There's no aesthetic for standing up for justice. If you haven't spoken out at all during this last week, ask yourself why. If you feel uncomfortable using your platform to stand up for justice, ask yourself why. If you feel comfortable posting about the Women's March, the Climate March, but not about justice for Black lives, ask yourself why. Thank you, Ariel. I also want to thank some people that you can't see um, on the screen. I want to start by thanking Dr. Penny McPherson Myers, who has worked tirelessly on this event as well as the series. I want to also thank Allison Gunn, the host who introduced uh, this event uh, earlier, and Don Singleton, Dr. Singleton uh, of Ascend, who is trying uh, to answer all of your questions, get those to me, respond, direct them to panelists, as well as Gabby McAllister, who is also managing the question and answer section. I want to also direct you to our website. Uh, please go to rowan.edu uh, slash diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, and check out the resources as well as our next uh, session, which will happen next Monday. Can we get the flyer for the next session up so that you can see that uh, we are going to be talking about an important topic? And we want you to join us on June 8th at 3 p.m. Uh, the topic is I can't breathe a discussion of racial battle fatigue, trauma and self care. I apologize to all of you that had questions we couldn't get to. That's why uh, we want to direct you to our website. We will share those questions with our panelists and we will try to address them as well uh, through social media. Again, please share your experience uh, on our Instagram site. Um, which is at Rowan DEI, Twitter at Rowan DEI, and on Facebook, uh, Rowan DEI. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And most importantly, thank you for your action. Go out and do something, say something, be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Have a good day, everyone.